Hello, and welcome to the AOCF's Getting Started video on Theta and Cooling. I'm Chris Knight, and one of the team leads for the AOCF Catalyst team. The intention with this slide deck is, is for it to serve as a self-contained, quick reference guide to help users with setting up their software environments, compile codes, and submit jobs. In many slides, you'll, you'll see pointers to the AOCF user guides, where you can view additional details and discussion of their various topics. After covering system overviews and several key topics for the Theta and Cooley resources, I'll then spend some time discussing general tips for troubleshooting issues before concluding. Uh, Theta is very much a, a bridge between the Mira and the upcoming Exascale Aurora system. And here, the you know the emphasis is on both on, on all three categories of simulation, data, and learning, and enabling those at scale. Uh, and using Theta today as a means to get projects ready for tomorrow on Aurora. Um, it, it's a Cray XC40 system running the Cray software stack at 11.7 petaflops peak performance, at 4,392 nodes of the second generation Intel Xeon Phi. This is codenamed the Knight's Landing. Uh, the, the core is running at, at around 1.3 gigahertz. Uh, it depends if, if you're running uh, heavy with AVX 512 instructions or scalar code for the dynamic frequency. And, and each core has four hardware threads. Um, memory, there's a lot of memory on these nodes if, if, if you're used to some other architectures. 192 gigabytes of DDR4 and 16 gigabytes of what is referred to as the MCD RAM memory, high bandwidth memory. Uh, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Um, and also attached to each node is 128 gig solid state drive. And so the, combined with the large amounts of memory, and the solid state drive really does offer some unique capabilities in terms of data and learning. And also in the simulation space. Um, the network, uh, Cray, Aries, high speed interconnect, Dragonfly topology. Um, and of course, you know, the project file system is a, a 10 petabyte luster file system with a price approximately 210 gigabytes per second throughput. Uh, a little more closer look at the full system. Um, at, at the smallest scale, the a single socket KNL, KNL node, 64 cores, four hardware threads per core. Um, four of those nodes make up a, a compute blade. 16 of those compute blades form a, a chassis, which is essentially one third of a rack. And so three of those chassis will, will can constitute a full rack of theta. And 24 of those cabinets make up the full system. And so all together is how you get the, arrive at the 4,392 KNL nodes, uh, 1,152 Aries switches, uh, 12 groups. If, if, if you're concerned about, if, if you're interested in the properties of the network, the Dragonfly topology, there are, there are 12 groups on, on the machine, and uh, total bisection bandwidth of 12.1 ter uh, terabytes per second. Um, and so again, uh, a lot of memory, a lot of solid state disk drive on the machine. And so this really does offer, again, to, to repeat myself, some, some unique capabilities in the data and learning space, as well as simulation. Um, the, a little more details on the memory modes. This is one of the things I, I think that is unique to the KNL. There are uh, the two types of memory on the node. There's the, the DDR4 memory and the high bandwidth memory. And your application can access these memory address spaces in, in a number of ways. Uh, in cache mode, you can access a, a single large memory space uh, with the DDR feeding to the in-package memory at 90 gigabytes per second and the CPU accessing the in-package memory at 480 gigabytes per second. And so in cache mode, you, you get access to all of that memory. Uh, with and, and this is one means by which an application can make use of all of the memory on a node without any changes to the source code. Uh, in flat mode, you are explicitly setting control over how memory is allocated. You can explicitly allocate into the DDR4 memory, the, the slower memory, or you can explicitly allocate into the high bandwidth memory. Uh, and examples of, of where an application may do that is uh, if, if many of your kernels are, are not memory bandwidth sensitive or bandwidth limited, you can allocate, typically you can allocate those arrays into the DDR4 memory. And then you can save the high bandwidth memory uh, you can allocate those to the DDR4 memory, which has a lower latency. Uh, and so for arrays that do uh, feed into kernels that are higher memory bandwidth limited, you can then allocate those arrays out of the high bandwidth memory. 
An example may be fast Fourier transforms. Typically, for those arrays, you would want to allocate those out of the high bandwidth memory. And it may be the other case for, for other arrays, uh, maybe more, more compute-intensive kernels, where the, certain arrays are principally used, you can allocate those out of the DDR4 memory. And then there are also hybrid modes where you can allocate some percentage of the in-package memory as an, uh, a cache. There's much more detail in all of the different uh, configurations that are available on Theta, available at that website. And so users, through their job submission, have access to all of these modes if, if you want to explore performance impacts on your application. Um, I'll say more about that uh, in several slides later. Uh, the th uh, Theta is a typical Cray programming environment. Uh, much of the, the same software that you may be familiar with if you've already run on a Cray system. Uh, there's Fortran, C, C++, Python compilers. Uh, you know, there's a handful of programming models, distributed memory, uh, shared memory, global arrays. OpenMP is available in the system, uh, PGAS. Uh, you know, a number of tools for, for debugging and for performance uh, and for some, a couple of porting tools. Uh, optimized scientific libraries, if, if your application is dependent upon, you know, BLAST, uh, you know, DGEMS, Glaypack, the sort related FF fast Fourier transforms. There, there's a handful of, oppor uh, of options available. Uh, you can use Cray's LibSci, uh, MKL is available, uh, and some, a handful of other libraries are also available. It, and if you choose, you can build your own. Um, and also a couple of IO libraries. Uh, for, for navigating the system, uh, a number of things are located in slash soft, and so that, that is a directory structure where you can you know, peruse. Uh, you know, typical directories are, you know, there's compilers, debuggers, libraries, uh, perf tools, and also visualization. Uh, a number of those are uh, enabled via the use of modules, which I'll get to on the next slide. Uh, but th those directories are there. And then there are other things. Uh, if you're using uh, uh, community, some uh, handful of community chemistry codes, there, there's a, a soft applications directory that has a couple of applications in there as well. And a lot of the, the, these softwares and libraries are labeled or listed on the ALCF website. Uh, additionally, there are a number of machine and deep learning and workflow uh, piece of software and libraries available on the machine. Uh, I, I won't go through the, lo the full list, but I, you'll notice that a handful of these do have uh, are, have been selected for presentations at, at the workshop. Uh, Many of these uh, tools and libraries are, you know, are optimized with performance libraries, such as MKL or MKL DNN. Um, there are a handful of, of workflow and data analysis tools. Uh, Singularity containers is one example, Balsam for workflows. Um, and there's a handful of uh, Python installations as well, Cray, Intel, and um, Anaconda. And so many of these are accessible through the, the modules. And modules is how we could control the environment on the, the system. Uh, if you're not familiar with modules, th there's a website up there that you can go to for a, a quick recap. We, we also have a lot of information on the ALCF website. Uh, basically, th this is a, a tool for, for managing your user environment, for, for loading paths it, for, of certain applications into your path, and, uh, setting up paths for the different libraries that you may be linking. Um, this is also the, uh, the key mechanism by which you can change the compiler that you have in your environment. Uh, a handful of, of useful commands. Uh, you can do a module help that will list all of the available module commands. Uh, you can see a list of what's currently loaded in your environment. So this is something that you could do when you first log into the machine to check what your default environment is. You could do module avail to see the long list of all the modules that are available. Uh, you can add a module to your environment with module load and then the name of the module. And you can also remove a module with the unload uh, argument. Uh, for Certain modules, you, you may want to swap them instead of explicitly loading and unloading. So you can then use the module switch, the old mode, maybe that's the current compiler in your environment, and then followed with the new mod module, which may be the new compiler that you want to switch to. Maybe you want to switch to from an Intel compiler to the GNU compiler. So using module switch is one mechanism to do that. Um, and if, if you want to see additional information about what the, actually that module and how it changes your environment, you can do module show in that module. And then you'll see a, a, an outcome of all the commands that are executed to, to update your environment. For compiling, 
There are a handful of Cray compiler wrappers that are needed to, to cross-compile from the login nodes to the theta compute nodes. And so it's really critical when, when building your application for the compute nodes that you use these wrappers, the lowercase cc, uppercase cc, and for Fortran, FTN. Uh, do not use some variant of the MPI, uh, cc or F90. These, these will not generate code for the, the compute nodes. Um, and again, as, uh, as I stated on the earlier slide, if, if you want to switch compilers, you can use module switch or module swap. The, the, they offer the equivalent functionality. And so I have examples of the, the Intel compiler is, is loaded into your environment by default. You can switch to the, the Cray, GNU, or the c compilers uh, using the appropriate swap command. Um, the Cray MPI, wrap, the Cray wrappers, um, they do a lot of they do a lot for you, um, and depending on the application that you're building, you you may want to know more about what that Cray wrapper is actually doing. Um, and so if, if 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 you're running into issues and you think it may be something related to, to how you're using the compiler, you can see explicitly what is being invoked with the dash Cray pe dash verbose command, and this will give you the full list of options and uh, headers and libraries that are being uh, used on that command. Uh, Sometimes uh, for your application, you may not, so by default, the, the, the Cray compilers will load Cray's libsci math library. And in, in many cases, that, that's, said, that's more than sufficient. And in other cases, you may, not, you may not want that, or you may want a finer grained control over what gets linked in for maybe your BLAST, your SCLAPAC, your FFTs, et cetera. And so you can disable that automatic linking with module unload Cray libsci, so the no automatic linking of a math library will take place. And then on your link line, you can then explicitly link in math libraries in the order that you'd like. Um, I do this sometimes when I'm, I'm mixing MKL with, with other libraries uh, and, and libsci. Um, so you, you've got onto the machine, you've navigated the software environment, you know where all the libraries you are to, needed to build your application, and you successfully compiled and built your application. And now it's, it's time to, to prepare submitting a job. Uh, First thing to do is make sure that you're a member of an active allocation. Uh, everyone in here should be a member of an active allocation. If not your original project, the one for the, this particular workshop, the SDL workshop. Uh, in general, what can happen uh, near the end of uh, an allocation is, is when people may run into problems with a negative balance. And so checking the projects in that situation is a good first step to see is, is your allocation still active. Um, one good thing to, to be mindful of is disk space. You, you, you really don't want to, to submit a, a very important job, have, have it wait in the queue, and then the job fails because you, don't, you ran out of disk space. Uh, and so good things to do, uh, maybe you're doing something in your home directory. I don't encourage that when you're running a production job, but maybe you are. You can use the my quota command to check the quota of your home directory. For your project directories, uh, you can you run the my project quotas command to see the full list of all project directories you're a member of and to get a, a sense of our, how near the, the quota limit you are and if there's enough space available for your job. Uh, and, and really to, to stress, the, the, the parallel file system is, is what you want to run your jobs out of and that's the, the project directory for your particular project that you're working on. Um, and that's really where you want to run the bulk of your calculations out of. And then lastly, um, checking to make sure that you have enough hours in your allocation. You, you, it is good for, in terms of having priority in the queue to have a positive allocation uh, for your project. And the, the tool to, to query those types of questions would be the SBank tool. And so there's a, a lot of more information on the SBank tool at the website on the top of the slide. A few, a, a few useful commands are uh, listing the allocations for the project that you're a member of. And this is, it may be a little hard to read, but there's S bank, and then the letter L, and then the letter A for list allocations. If you want, if, if you're maybe the PI of a project and you want to get a detailed report for a particular user, you can then add on the option for dash U and the user. And a, a comment that I'll make is that, uh, in general, charges for jobs that are submitted are, are based on the node count. With the caveat being that 128 nodes is currently the smallest allocable unit. And so if you submit a job for 256 nodes, you'll be charged for that 256 nodes, whether or not your job actually uses those nodes. If you submit a 16-node job to the default queue, 
your job will get allocated 128 nodes. And so although your calculation is only running on 16, you'll still be charged for the full 128. And I'll, I'll have a, a few words near the end on, on how, to, uh, to how you can make the best use of in that case. Um, so continuing on with Cobalt, uh, th this is the, the resource management software that we use on the ALCF systems uh, across all of the systems. Uh, if, if, if it does have syntax that is similar to, to PBS style scripts, um, and, and you may be familiar with some of these commands, uh, if, if you want to submit a job, you can use the Q sub command. And I'll, I'll comment that all of these have you know, man pages that you can look at for additional detail. Uh, the, you can query the status of your job with QStat. You can delete a job with QDel. Uh, followed by the job ID. Uh, you can alter the parameters of a job using QAlter. Maybe you submitted a job, it's a crude score for a while, and you, for, you realize that you need to extend the wall time, and, but the job hasn't started yet. You can use QAlter to, to extend that wall time, and you'll continue accruing score at that point, um, after that point, without losing any score. Uh, maybe you've submitted your job, and you realize that you really want the job to move in a different queue. Uh, and a good example of that would be this workshop this week, that maybe you, by default you, you submit your test job and it goes into the default queue and you wonder why it's not starting. But then when you look at the, the status, you see a bunch of idle nodes. Many of those nodes may be idle nodes that are reserved for this workshop. And so then you would use queue move to take the job that you had accidentally submitted to the default queue and move it into the workshop's special queue. Um, uh, maybe you've submitted a job and you realize there's a big issue. Maybe the, the input's not ready or something else. And so you can use QHold to, to place that job on hold. It'll stop accruing score at that point. You can fix whatever the issue may be, and then you can then Q release the job to continue accruing score from where it left off. And so the alternative would be then deleting the job, losing all of the score that you've accrued, and then starting fresh. And so QHold and QRelease if used sparingly, maybe a good alternative in that case. Um, for, for submitting your job, there, there's a number of, of options that can be specified. Some are, have good defaults, but many I, I would explicitly set. Uh, that's my advice. Uh, the, the project that's going to be charged for the job that you submitted, you'd want to use dash capital A. Uh, this is an example where it will pick a default project um, if you don't specify the project, but that may not be the project you want uh, allocated for that job. So it is good to explicitly set this. Uh, dash Q, the, the default for dash Q would be the default Q. Uh, in general, that works uh, uh, fine on Theta, but there, there may be reasons to explicitly set it, and so I, I would encourage explicitly setting it. The maximum wall time for your job, dash T, and you can specify the time in minutes, or you can give an hour minute second, uh, an hour minute notation. Uh, the number of nodes allocated for your job, dash N. The number of processes, dash dash proc count. Ah, sorry, the, some of this is a typo from the Blue Gene queue. Uh, the, there's more information on the next slide. Uh, but dash O to, to have the file prefix for some Cobalt log files that are generated. If you'd like a notification for your job uh, in email when it starts up and when it completes, you can use dash M followed by your email address. Um, and then one important uh, option is dash dash dependencies. And so I, I point this out that even if you've been running on the systems for a while, this may be a, a, an option that you've forgotten. If you find that your workflow, you have a long sequence of jobs, but the second job can't start until the first job completes, the third job can't start until the second job completes, and so on, I, I would highly advise making use of the dependencies to, to improve your throughput through the queue with uh, score boosts. Um, and uh, finally, dash I for an interactive job. Maybe you want to log in to the, not necessarily the compute nodes, but a service node, and interactively submit jobs while you're debugging an issue. So that's something that I frequently use when I'm debugging issues on the machine. I submit the job once, get onto the, the system when my nodes have been allocated, and then I can run multiple app runs uh, within that interactive job. Uh, jobs are, are submitted on Theta with a job script, and inside of that script, the, it is the app run command that is used to actually launch the application onto the compute nodes. And so this is a, a relatively simple example of my, my script.sh. This is an executable script. And so if you go to QSub your script and you get an error message about uh, the, your script not being an executable, 
uh, executing the, the change mode command to make it executable will fix, fix that. Uh, the, a couple of lines near the top uh, start with the pound cobalt. And so these are setting the cobalt's uh, Q subparameters right in your script. And so this, the alternative to doing this would be to have your Q sub command followed by a long list of, of options. The alternative here is that you can specify those options within your job script, and it's just one more way of having a record of what you, you submitted in that case. Uh, and so the good defaults, you know, dash A for the project, dash T for the maximum wall time, dash N for the number of nodes your job is being submitted on, uh, dash O if, if I want to change the output of, of the name of the output from the cobalt logs, uh, and then the, the Q. The line below that is specifying the memory mode. And so the default memory mode uh, for a job will be allocated to would be in cache quad mode. Uh, it's, it's good to explicitly set that so that you can ensure that, you know, that is the memory mode that you're requesting. And that's, uh, a, that's accomplishable with the attributes flag. Um, and then there's an echo command. And then the app run. And then app run is where your application is getting launched. Uh, you can specify the total number of MPI ranks for the job with dash lowercase n. You specify the number of MPI ranks per node with dash capital N. And then the section that follows afterwards in that box are our settings to control the affinity on the, the node. Uh, and so dash D, uh, dash J, and the dash dash CC are, are three arguments that, that you'll use to control how you want MPI ranks and, and threads placed on the machine. And we'll go through a, a couple of examples uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, the app run settings are followed by the, your application, the executable, and then any uh, application arguments that you may have. Um, uh, a quick overview of, of the app run and its options. A lot of this information is available on the website with, with additional helpful hints. Um, I'll say that, you know, the dash D, uh, so to, to repeat, uh, you know, dash lowercase n is, is the total number of ranks for that app run instance. Dash capital N is the number of MPI ranks per node for that instance. Controlling the number of hyper threads available per an MPI rank is controlled by dash D. And so this is effectively dash D is controlling the spacing of between MPI ranks. Uh, if dash J is controlling the number of hyper threads that are active per core, and so again, with the KNL, you have potentially one, two, or four hyper threads that can be running for your application. And you'll use dash J to control whether one, two, or four of those threads are active uh, for, your app, for your application. Uh, environment variables are specified with dash lowercase e, and then the environment variable that you'd like to set. And then uh, one parameter that I do encourage using if, if you are not using all of the threads for your application is dash R. To, for core specialization. And so this will shift things like the, the OS processes off to a, a, a single uh, hyper thread that the application is not using. And this would be one, this is one mechanism to help reduce variability in your runtime, at, at least on the, the, the on node sources of variability. Uh, and if, if you're getting started, you know, a couple of environment variables that you may need, you know, dash E, OMP num threads, if, if you're running an OpenMP multi-threaded application. Uh, you may want to control the affinity by some other means, like KMP affinity. And so in that case, you would do dash dash cc none to tell app run that you want to control the affinity by some other means, and, and then KMP infinity with the appropriate settings. Um, now, a, a couple of app run examples. And so the, the first example here is motivated for uh, an MPI only type of an application. Uh, and so uh, Theta's KNL nodes, they have 32 tiles each. And so that's how you get 64 cores. You have two tiles for two cores for each of those 32 tiles. Uh, and again, each core has four hardware threads. And so in this simple example, we're going to run a, a two node calculation with 64 ranks per node. And we'll only have one thread per rank and one th rank per core. And the app run setting for that uh, process is listed below. And what you can see is with dash J equal to one, uh, we, we only have one hyper thread active within a core. And so that's what the, the images are representing, is that you have a tile. Uh, I'm showing four tiles in this example, and then the dot, dot, dot would be the remaining tiles. Uh, within each tile, there is the two cores. And then you can see the black crosses is trying to, dis the, the, to denote the, the, the individual hyper threads within a core. 
And in this example, dash J is 1, and so then only one hyperthread is active per core. Dash D is 1, and so the MPI ranks that we're going to lay out are spaced apart by a single active hyperthread. There are 64 MPI ranks active per node, and so then the first D, the first 64 processing elements that are formed by the D hyperthreads would be uh, assigned as the, the master rank, the, or would be assigned a, an MPI rank. And then you can check the affinity with an example with, uh, there's an affinity example that I'll, I'll show up that you can see a path to at the end of the talk where you can check to make sure that did you supply the right app run settings and, and get the, the process layout that you were expecting. And so if you're new to the k and or the app run command, it would, it's a good exercise to, to check the affinity for small test cases. In uh, the second example, and in this example, uh, again, we're running with two nodes. Uh, in this case, we're going to run with only 32 MPI ranks per node. We're going to run with four open MP threads per rank but we're only going to use two uh, hyperthreads per core. Um, depending on your application, you may see additional benefits by using all four hyperthreads. Um, and so that, that's a good thing to check is, you know, how does your performance, how is your performance impacted by one, two, or four? And in general, you may see performance, if you're very compute intensive, limited at one hyperthread per core, or maybe you'll see a small boost at two hyperthreads, um, it, it, maybe even four. Um, and so in this case, you can see that dash J is two. We're going to use two hyperthreads that are available for each core. Dash D is four. And so that's indicating that the MPI ranks are going to be spaced by four hyperthreads. And so with this layout, we see that the MPI ranks are going to be placed on the first active hyperthread of a tile, and that the open MP threads for each rank will be shared on that tile. Um, and you can see the ordering, uh, you know, the ordering is 0, 1, uh, 2, 3, in, in the order of the, t the cores of the first hyperthread. And then the, the process repeats with 64, 65 for the second hyperthread of each core. Um, and then the, the affinity output below. And so the, most of the, the affinity output here is, is being generated with a toy example that I have at the end uh, of the slides. And so if, if you want to explore this, you could grab that example that I'll show the path to and run some uh, experiments like this. And so this would be a good opportunity for an interactive job. You submit a one interactive job, get onto the system, and then you could run multiple app runs with different settings to check the affinity to get the, the process placement that you, that you do desire. Um, and so uh, a quick overview um, to, to repeat a, a few things, but just to, to call more attention to them. Uh, you, with app run, uh, you can use dash D and the dash dash CC depth to let app run have control over the affinity, which you can then control as in the, the examples I just showed. If, if you would like to control the affinity by some other means, you can use dash dash CC none, and maybe you can use OpenMP or, or the KMP type environment variables to control the affinity by that means. Uh, core specialization, you, you can activate that with the dash R, and the idea here is that you'll use You'll, you'll set us the idle threads that your application is not using can be allocated to handle processes like the OS jitter um, and an MPI. And again, this is one mechanism by which you can try to reduce variability uh, for, for the on-node uh, portion of that, on-node contribution to variability. Uh, 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 one more comment on the memory mode. Uh, you can, exp if, if you are allocating uh, if you're requesting nodes in flat mode and you want to explicitly uh, allocate to either the DDR or to the high bandwidth memory, you can specify that control with NUMA control. Uh, you can use dash M to, to have mandatory allocation into NUMA control one in this example. Uh, one is the high bandwidth memory, zero the default is the DDR4 memory. Or you can have a preference. And so the difference with dash M is if you run out of memory in that space, the, the application will exit with an error. You can, or you can prefer allocation into one of the spaces. And if, if you run out of memory in that space, you'll just you'll fall back to the other available space. And you you want to place the the NUMA control and its arguments. Uh, I I typically place it at the end of my app run arguments, but before the application. 
And so if you're running your application in flat mode and you want control over the memory mode, or how memory is allocated at, by default, you can use, specify it with that. Um, so you've, you've, you've figured out, you've, you've got your code compiled, you've figured out you know, how you want to submit your job into the compute nodes, and, and you've queue subbed your job and now it's submitted. The, one of the first things that you'll probably do, and I, I'm notorious for doing this, is I, I want to check the status. Is my job submitted? Is it, you know, what's the status of it in the queue? And so the, the queue stat command is what you'll want to use for that. And so you can run queue stat, and you'll get a, few, a full listing of everything that's queued on the job and all the various states. Uh, some people may find that the default output generated can be overwhelming, uh, that, that many, there are many columns generated. And so I offer, uh, but one piece of advice that you have with QStat, the, the control over to, to customize the output that you see. And so I, in this example, I'm using the, the dash dash header flag to specify that I only want a, a subset of available columns. And if, if you look at the man page, you can see the full list of everything that's available for printing. And so in this example, uh, I'm looking at the job ID, the user, the maximum wall time submitted, the number of nodes requested, the, the state of the job, uh, running, you know, the job is running on the compute nodes. Queued, the, the job is waiting for uh, nodes to be allocated to it. Uh, starting is a, another state that you may see. Uh, if, if the jobs you've requested are all in the memory note mode that you've requested, the, the starting state, the time that it's spent there, may be relatively small. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, the note mode, the memory mode that you've requested, uh, the nodes need to reboot to, to get you that mode, you may have be in the starting state for up to 15 minutes or so. And so I'll, I'll mention this again later, but that, that's one thing to be mindful of if you notice that your job's in the, the starting state for, for several minutes, is that it is starting, it's just waiting for nodes to, to reboot in the memory mode you've requested. Um, your, your job's queued, uh, and so I've, I've, uh, if, if you want to see the, the full detail of, of your job, you can use the qstat-f with the job ID. And this will show uh, lots of, of COBOL-specific information for your particular job that you may, may find useful. Uh, you can show you know, everything that's uh, listed for your job with the dash FL argument. Uh, if you want to look at all jobs from a particular user, you can use dash U. And then more likely, you'll, you'll put in your user uh, name in that case. And if you want to see information about the queues that are available uh, on the system, you can use the dash capital Q argument. And so if, if you ran this today on the system, you would see information about the SDL, uh, the training queue. Uh, again, if, if you want to delete your job from the queue for some reason, you can use the QDEL command. Uh, if you want to alter the properties of your job, uh, you can use the QAlter command. In, in this example, um, I'm altering the maximum wall time of the job. So I use dash T to specify the wall time, and then the new time that I want to set the wall time too, and then the, the job ID. Uh, the second example is altering the number of nodes that are available. And then the last example is maybe I want to move my job to a different queue. And so this week, a good example of that would be if, if you accidentally submit it to the default queue, you could move it over to the, the training queue in the system to, to increase your, your throughput in the, the queues. Um, one thing that you can do, whether you're sitting at a terminal or you're, you're on the bus you know, on your way home, is you, you can check the status of your job. And so if you go to the, the status.alcfanl.gov slash data slash activity page, you, you can see a, a current snapshot of everything that's running on the system. Uh, near the bottom of the, the image, there are tabs. You can select uh, the running jobs, uh, jobs that may be in the starting state, uh, uh, jobs that are queued. And an important one to be mindful of is you can also check for reservations. And so if, as one example of you know, you know, why are a bunch of nodes on the machine idle, you could go to, to this web page and, and click on the reservations tag, and you may see that a lot of those idle nodes are allocated for a reservation that's in place, like this workshop. Um, now, once you've, you've hit QSub on your, your submission script and your job was successfully queued up, uh, a couple of things will happen. The, the first thing that'll happen is that you'll see the, the creation of a, a, a log file. And so this, this will happen right after your job is submitted and it'll immediately have a, a small amount of information that'd be helpful you know, uh, on the job that was submitted. Uh, when your job enters the running state, you'll then see the appearance of two additional files from COBOL, the, the output file and the error file. So output has all of the standard output directed to it, and error file has all of the standard error uh, directed to it. 
Uh, you can use QSubs dash capital O if, if you want to change the name of those files. Um, uh, a word on queues. Uh, so the much more information about the queues on Theta are available on the, the scheduling policy for the XE40 systems webpage. Uh, I'll, I'll note that uh, jobs it by, are, are by default are routed to a, a single default queue. Uh, nodes uh, allocated to the job, they'll be rebooted if needed. Uh, one thing to note is that even though you're requesting the default memory mode, it may be that the jobs you've been allocated were in some other memory mode. And so there, there's always uh, an opportunity that, that the nodes may be rebooted for your particular job. And so it, it's good to pad for that, to account for that when you're submitting your wall time. And so, uh, you know, an estimate of, you know, an additional 30 minutes is, is helpful to include. Um, uh, you know, a piece of advice, uh, you know, we really encourage, if, if you see your job in the starting state for several minutes, you know, please don't delete that job. Uh, what will happen is you'll, those nodes are going to continue rebooting no matter what. They're, they're already in that state. But when you delete your job and then you resubmit the job, you may potentially request a, a second set of nodes that don't overlap with the first set and trigger an additional reboot. Um, and so it is good that even if you see it in the, the starting state for several minutes, to, to, to go ahead and leave it in there, and it, it should eventually run uh, after the nodes had rebooted. Uh, on theta, the, the wall clock time limits are a function of the number of nodes requested. And so if, if you look on the web page, you'll, you'll see a tiered structure. Uh, small jobs can run for a relatively short amount of time, a, a few hours, and whereas the larger jobs can run anywhere up to, to 24 hours. Uh, and so uh, the website is currently that, you know, the minimum allocation is 128 nodes. And so, the, again, if, if you were to submit a, a smaller job, you, you, you can submit that smaller job in the default queue, but you'll, you'll still be allocated and charged for the, the full 128 nodes in that case. Uh, and, and today, uh, capability jobs on the machine are, are considered those requesting uh, 802 nodes or more. Uh, for small-scale development and testing, we, there, there are a couple of 16-node debug queues, and, and these are preset into the cache quad and the flat quad memory modes. And so if you're doing testing in one of those two modes on a small number of nodes, you, you can specifically set dash Q to one of the debug queues to, to have an improved turnaround time. Um, Again, uh, there's a, uh, a much more information on the scheduling policy and running jobs on, on those websites there. Uh, I, I've already, I think, repeated myself a couple of times on the 128 nodes, but if, if there's any questions about that, please do ask. Uh, if, if you're in the situation where the individual calculation that you want to run just not, does not require more than 128 nodes, one thing to consider is do, do you have a, a large collection of those types of calculations that you'd want to run? If so, there are a handful of, of paths forward to, to bundling those independent calculations together into a single job submission that you can then scale up that job submission to 128 nodes or ideally uh, to some larger node count. Uh, it, it can be as simple as, in some cases, it can be as simple as listing multiple app run commands within your job script, uh, backgrounding all of those processes, and then having a wait command to, to, to wait for all those app runs to complete. That would launch, uh, you know, n independent app run calculations across the, your job allocated nodes. Uh, for more complex workflows, maybe the, the dependencies between jobs that are submitted, uh, there there are tools available such as Balsam that that may offer you uh, that may facilitate some more complex workflows within a job script. Um, and so the, the, there'll be a talk later at the workshop, I believe, on that. Uh, and again, to, to reiterate. Uh, you know, for long sequences of jobs where the, you know, job two has to run after the first job and job three has to run after the second one, you know, I do encourage using dependencies. When the lead job finishes, uh, a fraction of the score that that job had when it started will be passed on to its dependent job. And so there, there will be, a, it's essentially a score boost to help your throughput in the queue. Um, so that concludes bo the, the bulk of the content I had for Theta. Were, were there any questions? Uh, I, only, I have a, a couple of slides on Theta. Uh, or, sorry, on Cooley. Okay. Um, and so a very quick summary of Cooley, uh, which is another resource we have here at the ALCF. Uh, Cooley is primarily uh, serving as an analysis and visualization resource. And so Cooley is mounted to the project file system 
systems on both Mira and Theta. And, and so a workflow that you may in, have is uh, doing a lot of your computation uh, for the, the bigger calculations on Theta. And then maybe you have some smaller scale uh, analysis or, or visualization that you, you, you may not want to do that on Theta. Uh, you, you can do that on Cooley as, as another option. And so all of the file systems are mounted to, to allow that uh, type of a workflow. Uh, Cooley is an x86 system with GPUs. It has 126 compute nodes. Uh, it has a peak performance of 293 teraflops. Uh, each compute node has two 2.4 gigahertz Intel Haswell processors. That's, that's six cores per CPU, 12 cores total. Uh, there's a, a, an NVIDIA Tesla K80 on each node. That's two uh, GPUs per node. There's 384 gigabytes of CPU memory, uh, 12 gigabytes of memory per GPU, and uh, 345 gigabytes of local scratch space for, for each node. Uh, the F, uh, FDR InfiniBand is interconnect. And uh, again, Mira's GPFS and, and Theta's Lustre's project file systems are both mounted to this. Uh, unlike Theta, uh, Cooley uh, uses soft environments to control the environment. And this is analogous to Mira if, if, if you've done work on Mira. Uh, very quickly, uh, th there's additional information on, on the user guides for Cooley. But very quickly, uh, there, there are keys in a .soft.cooley file that, that are read at login time. Uh, and so uh, an example may be that you want to use the GNU compiler in your environment. And so within the .soft.cooley file in your home directory, you could add an mvapage key. At the end of this file is the macro default. And so the, that default macro should always be at the bottom of your, your config file. Um, anytime you go to edit the, the .soft.cooley file, you can execute a, a resoft to, to refresh your environment given the changes that you've just made. Or you could log out and then back in. To, to have the environment changes take effect. And you can see the, the full complete list of, of all the environment keys with the soft environment command. Uh, you can choose the compiler via the soft environment command. So this is one primary re, uh, mechanism that you'll use to change your compiler. You can also load uh, Python interpreters this way. Uh, for non-MPI compilers, there's a handful of options, uh, GCC, Intel, uh, and CLang. Uh, maybe you, you do, in fact, need an MPI compiler. Uh, and Vapage and MPish are both available on this system. Uh, and so the, the keys that are shown here will, will pull in the latest version. Uh, for example, with Intel, th this would pull in the 2018 version of the compiler and the Vapage uh, MPI library. Uh, job scripts on Cooley, uh, th th they are similar in structure to the, the job scripts on Theta, except uh, instead of app run, uh, MPI run is being used. And so in this very relative, in this simple example, uh, the, it's a, a straightforward job script. Uh, the number of nodes is being uh, determined from the, a Cobalt node file. Uh, the total number of MPI ranks, in this case, is being, uh, you know, is a function of the number of nodes available times 12 cores per CPU. Uh, you can choose whatever is appropriate for your application. And then the job would be launched with MPI run dash F for that Cobalt node file. Uh, dash n for the number of MPI ranks, and then the name of your application. And you can specify additional environment variables and so on uh, within the script. And then you, you would submit that script with, uh, you could, again, because we're at a workshop, uh, you'd use the training queue, uh, you know, the number of nodes on Cooley. This is, example has five uh, running for 10 minutes, uh, charged against the, the workshop's project allocation, and then the, the name of the script that, that, that you're executing. Uh, on Cooley, uh, if, if the default queue is default, uh, you can use this for small test jobs, large long jobs. Uh, you could do you know, up to full machine for, I think it's 12 hours if you, if you need to for your analysis or visualization. There, there is also a debug queue for the shorter, smaller test jobs that have faster turnaround time. Uh, if, if your workflow that you're submitting needs access to a public network, you can use the PubNet queue. If you are using the GPUs and you don't want to load an X server, you can use the no X11 queue. Uh, and, and similarly, if, if you want to check the status of your job on the system or, or just the state of the machine, you can go to the act Cooley's activity page. Are there any questions on that? So again, the, the, the Cooley description was relatively short. There is a lot of information on the ALCF website if you have additional questions. So the, the last few slides uh, are, are just a very quick, you know, you've submitted your job uh, and 
you know, it just hasn't started yet. And so uh, a handful of, of things to consider are maybe there's a reservation in place. And, and that's why those nodes that you're viewing on the activity page are, are, don't seem to be running jobs. And so if you can go to the activity page and look at the reservation tab, or you can use the show res command to see what reservations are currently uh, in place, or which reservations are currently coming up in the near future. Uh, again, jobs that are on theta in the starting state, it, it may be the case that the nodes allocated to your job are still rebooting into the memory mode that you've requested, whether it's the default memory mode or a specific memory mode that you've requested. Um, it may be just that there are no available nodes in the requested queue. Uh, you know, maybe nodes are down, they're, they're busy running other jobs. Uh, nodes may be idle, but they may be draining for the job that's currently at the top of the queue. Uh, or they may, in fact, be reserved, like they are for this workshop. Again, you can check the status with QStat, you can go to the activity page. You know, also, you know, every Friday we, we do send a, a, a weekly updates email. We, we do uh, ad advertise all of the upcoming reservations, like, for example, like this workshop or, or preventative maintenance. And so that, that is a good source of information if you want to plan maybe the next week or two out. Um, and if you want to, you can get a list of the status of all the nodes on both Theta and Cooley using the node list command. And so I tend to use the node list command if I want to submit a, a small job, and or not necessarily a small job, but a, maybe a medium or large size job. And I want to figure out what's the smallest wall time I can submit my job to. So if I want to submit a medium to large size job and I want a quick turnaround, I'll, I'll use node list to figure out how many nodes are idle and to what that smallest wall time job I can fit. So maybe I can't submit an hour long job, it'll take a while to run to start, but maybe I can submit a, a 35 minute job and that'll probably run right away. So I, I use node list a lot when I want to try to turn around, have a quick turnaround time on larger jobs. Uh, Theta, uh, there's core files, uh, th which are our friend when we're having the bug issues. And so core files can be enabled on Theta. Uh, you can also use uh, ATP, abnormal termination processing, if you'd like. Uh, if you're using the Cray compiler, uh, everything is linked by default. If, if you're using the Intel compiler, you do need to, to add an additional li uh, library to your link line. And uh, there are the other debugging tools. And some of this, uh, for example, DDT will be discussed at the workshop. Uh, you can use STAT or, or full feature DDT. And then finally, when, when things go wrong, uh, you know, we, we do encourage you to examine core files. Uh, it is best to save all three files that are generated by Cobalt, the, the Cobalt log, the output, and the error. There is a lot of useful information that's in there that, that can be used to, to help understand what, what happened for your particular job. Uh, you try to retain more of the important information, the, the job ID, the machine name, uh, you know, the copy and location of files, what the exact error message was. Um, and and if, if you're not sure what happened, a good first place to turn is that Cobalt log file. Um, it, it's a number of times what can happen is maybe the job runs out of time. And so at the end of the log Cobalt log file, you'll see a message that the maximum mall time was exceeded. And so that, that's a very, uh, I think, a quick way to figure out some of the, the, the more straightforward issues. Um, and you know, always, uh, you know, please contact us if you're having issues. Uh, if, if you have an ALCS contact or, you, you, you know, folks here in the room during the workshop, you know, please reach out to us. You can always send mail to support at ALCS.AML.gov if, if you have issues. Uh, you can always call the ALCS help desk. Uh, the number is provided in the, in the, in the, in the